Why Medina? Medina, of course, is not its original name. Its original name is Yathrib, surrounded by volcanic rock. And it is blessed with an undercurrent of water. It has always been famous for its dates. And the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Bukhari as well, I have been commanded to emigrate to a city that shall devour all other cities. They call it Yathrib, but it is Medina. And so the Prophet ﷺ changed its name from Yathrib to Medina. And in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever says Yathrib, should say Astaghfirullah because it is Taba. And also in another hadith, he called it Al-Tayba. Taba and Tayba mean pure and the source of purity. In a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet said, Oh Allah, cause us to love Medina as much as we love Mecca or even more than this. And our Prophet told us that Dajjal will not be able to enter Medina. He will come to Medina trying to destroy it, but he will not be able to enter it because two large angels will meet him at the door and expel him and kick him out. Also, our Prophet said that no plague shall ever infest Medina. Also, our Prophet made dua that Medina be blessed. And he said, hadith is in Bukhari, that, Oh Allah, your servant and Abd and Khalil Ibrahim, he declared Mecca a haram. And I too am your servant and your Abd and your Rasul. So I make dua to you to make Medina a haram. Haram is an area of land that certain things which are halal outside of it become haram inside of it. For example, carrying weapons is haram in the haram. And so Medina is considered the second Thani al Haramain, the second haram in our religion. Mecca was blessed, some say, from when the creation was created, and then Ibrahim announced its blessing. Whereas Medina became blessed with the emigration of the Prophet to it. The Prophet said that no one shall plot to harm Medina except that Allah will dissolve him like salt is dissolved in water. Of the miracles that Allah Azza wa Jal chose Medina for, and this is clearly a divine wisdom, that SubhanAllah, out of all of the tribes of Arabia, out of all of the places in the peninsula, the Prophet had a direct blood connection with the people of Medina. In fact, he is a second cousin of some of them. The Prophet is a second cousin to the Khazraj because his grandfather's mother is a Khazraji. The number of people living in Medina, how many? The total population of the three Jewish tribes seems to have been around 2,000 men. Multiply that by three for women and children, you get 6,000 Jews, roughly, in Yathrib. The Quran itself references they're waiting for the next Prophet. But they expected that Prophet to be one of their own. They didn't expect him to be someone else. That Allah says they were expecting a victory over the Aws and the Khazraj. And the Aws and the Khazraj say that whenever we had a war, right, the Yahud would tell us that it's only a matter of time before our Prophet comes and will massacre you. This is the theory that is given. And that is that just like Salman al-Farsi knew that one of the signs of the Prophet is what? That he's going to come in a land of dates, right? So this knowledge was known. We know this for a fact. It was known. Why shouldn't these Yehud have it as well? They settle in a land of dates because they know that the Prophet will come in a land of dates. We also know that in the conquest of Mecca, the Ansar had around four to five thousand men participating in the conquest. So four to five thousand multiplied again by average of three, you have twelve to fifteen thousand Arabs. So quantity wise, the Arabs seem to be double the Jews. But the Jews had the power because they had the money and because they had the land and because they had fortresses. And so a rough quantity we get of the people of Medina, roughly around 20,000 people. The Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina, now we don't have an exact date, the first week of Rabi'ul Awwal, most likely. And Ibn Ishaq mentions that he arrived on a Monday, and this corresponds to September of the year 622 CE. So 622 is when one Hijra begins. Medina is not like a major metropolitan city. Medina is not continuously populated. Medina had small pockets and every tribe it was in its own small area. The very first settlement of these small settlements of the entire city was that of Quba, outside of what we now call central Medina. And these were separated by either desert or by large date plantations. So the Prophet when he arrived, we know he arrived in Quba and Abdullah ibn Salam narrates that when the Prophet entered Medina, the people rushed to take a look at him. And I was of the first who arrived when his face became clear to us, I knew that this face was not the face of a liar. 
and he said the first thing that I heard him say was spread the greetings of salam everywhere. Feed the people, be good to your relatives and pray at night when everybody is asleep, you will enter Jannah with peace. And the hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Salam and he is the Jewish rabbi who converted to Islam and he stays at the house of Kulthum ibn Hidim. It is also said that the Prophet stayed in the house of Sa'ad ibn Khaythama but some reports say that no, he would spend the night at the house of Kulthum and because Kulthum was a married man with children, he would go to the house of Sa'ad who was a bachelor. And so in this house, guests could come without any problem. And he waited there for Ali ibn Abi Talib to come. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala stayed in the house of another of the Ansar. And the next day, the Prophet began building the first masjid in Medina, which is now called Masjid Quba. And it is said that the first stone was put by the Prophet And it is said that by the time he began building, Ali radiallahu anhu had already arrived at as well. And Ali and Abu Bakr continued and then the Ansar took over from there. Ali ibn Abi Talib says every single week the Prophet would either walk or ride his camel to Quba. Usually on Mondays it is said. He would go there and he would pray two rak'at and he said whoever does wudu from his house and prays in Masjid Quba, he will get the reward of a full Umrah. Ali is a young boy at the time. He's a teenager. So he's around 19, 18, 19 now. And Ali was told to remain behind in Mecca to return the amounts and the items that had been given in trust to the Prophet ﷺ, the amanat. There is no bank account, there is no security deposit, there is no safety uh, box. What are you going to do when you have a precious item you're traveling? Or even if you don't want to keep it in your house for personal reasons, you give it to a trustworthy person. And so, subhanAllah, despite their animosity to the Prophet ﷺ, despite their hatred of him and his message, still when it came to entrusting what they needed to entrust, his house was the safety deposit. His house was where a lot of these amanat were kept. And so the Prophet ﷺ had to leave somebody to return these amanat, and that was Ali ibn Abi Talib. And they also waited for Aisha and Asma, the daughters of Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr had arranged for them to come via another guide. And so Ali and Aisha and Asma, when they came, that was when the Prophet ﷺ entered the city of Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ stayed in Quba the rest of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And he announced on Thursday night that he will enter Medina the next morning. And on Friday morning, he ﷺ leaves Quba and Salat al Jumu'ah occurs in the middle. So the first Jumu'ah that the Prophet ﷺ prayed was neither in Quba, he actually prays it in the tribe of Banu Salama region. And he gives the first khutbah. And this khutbah has been recorded by Ibn Ishaq in Al-Bayhaqi with a slightly weak chain. The first khutbah that he gave, two parts, the first part of it, he encouraged them to be generous and he reminded them of the certainty of death and of meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Allah Azza wa Jal would ask each and every one of them about what he had been given and what he spent with what he had been given. And in this khutbah, there is a phrase that is a part of an authentic hadith that we all know. And that is that whoever is able to save himself from the fire, even if with half a date, even with a portion of the tamra, let him do so. And if he doesn't even have this, then with kalima tayyibah, with a good word, because every deed is multiplied 10 times. Then he sat down. That's the first khutbah. Second khutbah, he stood up. In the second khutbah, he began with what is called the khutbah al haja. Verily, all praise is due to Allah. And only Allah Allah is worthy of being praised. Therefore, we praise him and nasta'inuhu. We will ask for his help and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our deeds and the consequences of our souls. Verily, whomever Allah guides, no one can misguide. Whomever Allah misguides, no one can guide him back to the straight path. I testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. This is khutbah al hajjah This khutbah is so powerful that people accepted Islam just because of this khutbah. And the most famous example is that of Limat al-Azdi and he was from the leaders of the tribes of Yemen and he was a medicine man. And when he entered Mecca, the people told him, beware of this man, Muhammad Sallallahu He is a sahir or a majnoon or a one of these things. So the mad said, I put cotton in my ears to make sure that I don't hear what he says because they warned me so much, I became terrified. So I put cotton in my ears every time he's, I see him so that I don't hear him. Then I said to myself that I am Rajul Aqil, I'm an intelligent man. I mean, how powerful can his speech be? If he's wrong, I'll guide him. If he's sick, I'm a medicine man, I'll cure him. So he took the cotton out and he walked up to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, your people have warned me about you, but I want to listen to what you have to say. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiru wa na'udhu billahi min shurooni ufusina wa zi'ata ma yahdi lahu falahu wa midhu wa ashadu wa la ilaha shurun surah. Then he said, amma ba'd. He was going to begin the speech. The man said, qif, repeat these words that you just said. So the Prophet ﷺ repeated the entire speech. He hasn't even begun the lecture. And Limad said, 
that I have memorized the shi'r of the ins and the jinn. I've memorized the poetry of everyone out there. And I consider myself an intelligent and educated man. But wallahi, I have never heard anything as eloquent as this. By Allah, you must be a man whom Allah inspires. And khalas, he accepted Islam right then and there. Khutbatul haja caused the mad al azdi to accept Islam. So he started with khutbatul haja in the second khutbah. And then he said, the successful one is the one whom Allah has beautified his heart and has caused him to enter Islam after leaving Kufr and has chosen him above the rest of the people for the best of all matters. Love what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and love Allah with your entire heart and never tire of the speech of Allah and of the dhikr of Allah. Kalam Allah is the Quran. The dhikr is his remembrance and never let your heart become hard. Allah chooses what he wishes and what he blesses and he has blessed this meaning the Quran and the dhikr to be the best deed. So worship Allah and do not associate partners with him and have taqwa of him as he said that you should and be sincere to Allah in all that you say. Love one another with the spirit of Allah between you and remember that Allah hates that his promise be broken wassalamu alaykum where he stopped to pray Jum'ah that also then became the masjid for that locality and then after this khutbah he then entered Medina